walking along, the um, general staff car came by, and he stopped them, and he said, uh, are you nurses from, uh, from Tripler? And they said, yes, we are. And he said, well, get back to your post immediately. We're being attacked by the Japanese. So they came rushing back, of course, woke us all up that we're still in bed. So we heard the mortars, and they were coming running right after another. You could hear them thump, 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 thump. As I got up and was moving to my left, the lieutenant was a little slow. He didn't make it. One land between us, he took the full blast. I got caught on the left side, picked me up and threw me. And there was an officer who came up behind me and grabbed my shoes <clears throat> and shoved me up there so I could get my hands on the combing there and get that door open. But when I looked back to see if maybe he could hold on to me and, and pull himself up, he had slipped back down below. And he didn't make it. <clears throat> I got out, I got out, uh, tasked with a mission that was to take place on the first day of the war. Now, I was the platoon sergeant, chief scout sniper for the sniper platoon from one of the infantry battalions. And to be honest with you, the mission that we were assigned, well, it, it seemed suicidal. And we were very reluctant to do it, but of course, being the good sergeant, just don't get a drink of water. We started to walk away, maybe about to hit her to the door, and boom! The ammunition dump blew up. We blew up. Killed all my men that I come through through the war with. That was <coughs> the saddest day of my life. Good men. True men, one of them. Memorial Day. Most see it as a time to go on vacation or have a barbecue. Memorial Day is much more than that. It is a time to remember those who are no longer with us, those who gave their lives for their country, to remember fallen comrades, and to support those who survived. Oceanside had a number of events to commemorate Memorial Day. Here are some of them. Most of us, we'd never experienced any kind of combat. We were all anxious, enthusiastic, and honestly a little frightened. We were anxious to finally get the opportunity to go and practice what for many years we had been training to do. We were enthusiastic because we actually believed that we were going to, to do something right. And we were frightened because we had no idea what to expect, the dangers, and of the unknown. One of the other strong memories that stays fresh in my mind is just prior to the ground combat operations starting off, we were tasked with a mission that was to take place on the first day of the war. Now, I was the platoon sergeant, chief scout sniper for the sniper platoon from one of the infantry battalions. And to be honest with you, the mission that we were assigned, well, it, it seemed suicidal. And we were very reluctant to do it, but of course, being the good servicemen that we were, the good Marines that we are, we didn't hesitate to step forward. My dilemma was that I had to choose the team to conduct the mission. And for quite a long time, 
I struggled with that choice, knowing that whomever I sent may not return. In the end, I had to choose the best Marines of my platoon. Of course, these were also my friends. Making that decision was a difficult one, but fortunately, by the grace of God, we didn't have to leave <coughs> that mission. Those few days aged me. What other experiences left an impression on me? Well, we all have heard about the uh, environmental dangers over there with all the oil fires. The best way I can demonstrate that is that one afternoon, once we crossed into Kuwait, the skyline was black, literally just inky black across the skyline. And within 30 minutes, that inky blackness had engulfed us. And I'm sure you've all been out way after midnight on a cloudy night, no stars, no moon, hard to see your hand before your face. This is what we advanced in, in that oily blackness into the unknown. We did have to continue. I'll also never forget the wreckage and the carnage of the battlefield. Most of it we had encountered was inflicted by the air. Some of it by our own forces. I'll never forget those. We've gone into harm's way many times. Several of the Marines who went through basic training with me were unfortunate enough to perish in Beirut when the Marine barracks there was destroyed. I spent a year in Saudi Arabia from 95 to 96. And during that time, there were two incidents that took more American servicemen. In Riyadh, the bombing of the OPM Sang headquarters the bombing of the barracks at Kobar Towers. We saw more young servicemen give their lives. I spent another couple of years out at American embassies, again back in the Middle East. And during that time, there was the bombing of the embassies in Nairobi and Addis Ababa. And one of our fellow Marine security guards, Corporal Alaganga, made the ultimate sacrifice. And most recently, we had the incident in the Middle East with the USS Cole, where many sailors perished. I think it's very fitting that we pause at least once a year on Memorial Day in memory of those who have gone before us. Thank you. That my job now had changed and I had to get to the MACD compound to relieve the pressure that was being imposed on the MACD compound. It was a compound of Army people and also they had civilians there and they were getting a lot of pressure. What he didn't say that it was right up against the Perfum River. So as we struggled through and with a lot of infantry uh, people, and unfortunately, RLT-226, that's Regimental Landing Team 226, which had already boarded the ship to return home, was called back. They were called back and the battle was so intense that we were unable to move my tanks forward because there were so many dead and wounded. Anyway, uh, I was fortunate enough to have two Quad 50 trucks, Army trucks come. They came up both sides, and we were able to march down that corridor. And we finally got to the Kashum River. We relieved pressure. I had two men wounded. Um, and then the thing that happened that people don't understand here is the fact that we had no heavy artillery or air support for three straight days. And the basic thing was that they had to try in some way to preserve the old city of Way. On the second day, um, I had gotten hit for the second time, but because I was the tank commander, because of my responsibility to all the other tankers, and the five tanks in which I had, uh, I remained. There's no way to get medevaced anyway. You couldn't get medevaced in all the river boats that the Navy was up and down the river that were being picked off just like in an arcade. And so on the third day, we were down, RLT was down to 15 men out of an entire regimental landing team. We had two M60s. 175 recordless rifle, and then I only had 16 rounds of armor Pearson left, and they could not get the concrete that we needed, the concrete rounds, 90 millimeter rounds to us, so that we could explode the buildings that the VCs were hiding in. It wasn't a very pretty war, it was very hard. 
when I got hit the third time, uh, Red, he's, he was the driver, and what Red did is he pushed my helmet out of the hatch and uh, closed all the hatches, and, and that's the protocol for tanks. If you're off the tank, it doesn't matter who you are, what position you hold, once the incoming starts, and if it's heavy, the tank closes up. It goes what we call turtle. So I tried talking to them from the outside. The lieutenant from RLT-226 and myself, and then through my helmet again, I could hear, I was being told that there was a company of NVA coming from the east and one from the west. And we were only down to those few rounds that I had told you about. The Citadel across the, across the river, Virginia River had not been clear. So we were on the south side. As we made that march, we were boxed in because nothing behind us was clear. And so the thing that happened was we were sitting down, we were conferring, looking at the map, trying to figure out how we were going to be able to defend. And in so doing, that's when I heard it. We used to call them the plumbers. I don't know what they call them now, Gunny. You know, but we heard the mortars, and they were coming right, right after another. You could hear them thump, 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 thump. As I got up and was moving to my left, the lieutenant was a little slow. He didn't make it one land between us. He took the full blast. I got caught on the left side, picked me up and threw me. And from that point on, I didn't remember anything for about a half an hour, and the fighting was still raging. And then uh, we start seeing planes. We start seeing the, the flying tigers, the Vietnamese tiger planes. Uh, we started seeing them coming in, and uh, then we start seeing the American jets coming in, and we really relieved the pressure, which we should have had three days prior. And, and we didn't. I was medevaced out in a Huey gunship. And um, the next thing I know, I woke up in Cameron Station the Hospital. I was in five different hospitals um, trying to recover. I was medevaced to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. And finally, this was in January, finally in May, uh, I was released. My family was in Philadelphia at the time, and I had nothing but my uniform. And to surprise the family, I decided not to call them for transportation or anything. So I was, uh, I was going home in my uniform with crutches and got caught in Center City, Philadelphia by a bunch of hippies who broke my ankles. And I went back into the hospital for another month and a half. So one day he said, hi, he said, we've been using German prisoners. He said, no, they can't come today. So he said, take some of your men and go out here and play up in little towns around here. Take the ammunition out of the little town and put it out in the field and, uh, uh, it, and have it definitely so we get rid of the ammunition. Well, I told the man that day, I said, now be careful. They can't come today. And maybe it might be booby trapped with a, of a pile of ammunition half as big as this room here. And so uh, we had loaded one truck and pulled it out. And then we went back and we put another truck back and, he did, and was loading it. And PFC from Kansas City, I lived at the peak of them. He said, listen, let's go get a drink of water. They started to walk away, maybe about some years of the door. And boom! The ammunition dump blew up. We blew up. Killed all my men that I come through through the war with. That was <coughs> on the saddest day of my life. Good men. True men. One of them was a uh, 43-year-old man. We called him Pops. But they all died, except the tools, and I was badly wounded. <coughs> I was unconscious. My ears broke. My ears were broken. My head was all 
knocked off and covered my shirts off my my jacket and my head and my shoulders and, and I was in the hospital for a long time uh, and at first I couldn't even recuperate. I, I thought when I awakened <coughs> that I was dead. Several days from now, we will be commemorating Memorial Day. And when we commemorate, let us put Memorial into Memorial Day. Give a thought and a prayer to our silent and unseen comrades as they have given up all of their tomorrows for our todays by making that ultimate sacrifice and preserving our precious freedom that we all cherish and making this day possible for us. The U.S. Army had 218 killed, 364 wounded. The Navy had 2,008 killed, which uh, a lot of them were still out there on the, on the Arizona and the Utah, and 710 wounded. The U.S. Marines had 109 killed and 69 wounded. For a total of 2,335 killed, 1,143 wounded, and there were 68 civilians killed. Now, uh, of course, they had civilian workers on there, but the, the, but the main casualties from the civilians was the shells, the anti-aircraft shells dropping uh, into the city and unfortunately killing people. Uh, we had nine battleships. And of course, we lost the Arizona, Oklahoma, and the Utah. And they sunk the California, Nevada, and West Virginia, but California, Nevada, and West Virginia lived to fight another day. And I was glad to see him. We're going into Saipan. There's a California out there doing the things with their big guns. And of the nine battleships, the Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee were damaged. That's uh, they need repaired. We had three cruisers that were damaged, Helena, Honolulu, and Raleigh. I'd been out taking field dancing the night before, so I was in bed sleeping. And uh, two of our night nurses had come off duty at 7 o'clock. They were uh, taking a walk in the uh, Kamehameha's Gardens, which was attached to our uh, grounds at Tripler at the time. And uh, they were in their white uniforms, of course. And through the gardens, there was a back road that led over to Hickam Field. And while they were walking along, the um, general staff car came by. And he stopped them and he said, uh, are you nurses from, uh, from Tripler? And they said, yes, we are. And he said, well, get back to your post immediately. We're being attacked by the Japanese. So they came rushing back, of course, woke us all up that we're still in bed. And uh, we thought, oh, come on, you're kidding. You know, this can't be. Anyway, and about that time, our phone rang to our barracks telling us all to report on duty. I, uh, all of our, I'd been working on the OB ward and uh, all our maternity patients had, had gone. I don't know, I never did find out where they all went to. Some of them went home. Some of them were sent to Queens Hospital in Honolulu. Anyway, um, I was assigned to this one ward. I remember my first three patients expired. At that time, a, uh, we learned later that a um, enlisted men's barracks at Hickam Field, a large, large barracks, received a direct hit. And of course, at this hour of the morning, on a Sunday morning, a lot of the fellows were still in bed sleeping. And so we had uh, just numerous casualties from there. There were horrible burns, severe burns all over their bodies. In fact, I recall trying to inject an intravenous needle into one arm of this one man, into the arm of this one man. And uh, as I used the alcohol sponge to cleanse the area, the whole skin from his forearm came off in one big piece. He was just crisply burned all over. And he, he expired before we could do anything for him. Well, the day went on that way. I mean, uh, we all, uh, doctors, nurses, corpsmen, worked as hard as they possibly could trying to save as many of the men and ease the pain of as many as they possibly uh, could. Pass the word for all hands to man your battle stations. And this is no expletive deleted. Man your battle stations immediately. <clears throat> So my battle station 
<coughs> excuse me, was number six boiler room, which is about as far down as you can get on a battleship. So I headed for my battle station, got to my battle station, number six fire room had already been flooded from the, the first shutter we had was torpedoes. And so they held us together in what they call boiler control. <clears throat> and we tried to close our watertight doors and there was one that we couldn't do close. <clears throat> so our officer in charge sent four of us up above the, the hatch to secure that. <clears throat> and by that time, the ship, we had a decided list. <clears throat> it was capsizing. <clears throat> Excuse me. The officer in charge said, don't worry. He said, uh, the, the men are going to close this hatch, and but the ship can't sink. It will settle to the bottom. Because there's, the battleships had what they call blister ledges on each side, which in case of something like that, you would counter flood the other side, and it should settle to the bottom. But instead of that, of course, it didn't. And we remained at our post there until the word was given to abandon ship. And about that time, our lights went out, and we were down below the third deck. And we had quite a time, I had quite a time getting out. And uh, I, by the grace of God and some help, I got out. But I got up to my living quarters and up to a ladder that led to a deck above. And that by that time, the ship had quite a list on it. And I couldn't, uh, the deck was about this way for me now. And I couldn't, I couldn't get up here. And if I could have got up here, I could reach a door to open to get outside of the ship. There was an officer who came up behind me and grabbed my shoes <clears throat> and shoved me up there so I could get my hands on the combing there and get that door open. But when I looked back to see if maybe he could hold on to me and, and pull himself up, he had slipped back down below. And he didn't make it. <clears throat> I got out, I got out, uh, out to the top side, and the ship then had quite a list on it, and the side of the ship was coming around where I was able to get on the side of the ship as the ship was rolling over. And regard, I understand that this movie shows men uh, leaving the ship with ropes and all that, and there, there was not a rope or anything. What we did, we walked <clears throat> over the side of the ship until the ship turned upside down, and then we walked on the bottom of the ship. And about that time, we were experiencing machine gunning because they were machine gunning us too. And one of my good buddies from Connecticut was killed there by me. And further back aft on the ship was one of our ship's band was also killed by machine gun fire. <clears throat> I had a brother with me on that ship and he was on the ship when it turned over and he was trapped in, a, in an engineer's washroom. And he, uh, in this washroom was a heavy set sailor, a chief water tender named Francis Day, who was one of my bosses, and a, a Catholic chaplain named Aloysius Schmidt. <clears throat> and he was a thin fellow, and they were pushing the men that were in trapped there out the porthole. And when they pushed all of them out that they could get out, and, Mr. and Day could not make it because he was too big. The chaplain attempted to go through the, the porthole, and <clears throat> I understand, not being a Catholic, I, don't, I understand a priest carries some, some type of a book, and I think they call it a breviary or something. And it was discovered later when they found the body, his body in the washroom, that the book that he had carried had caught on the hardware of the uh, porthole, and so he was drowned. And they named a the, uh, harbor after him back in Dubuque, Iowa, called Schmidt Harbor. So my brother did make it out, but they wouldn't let us serve together anymore. So he went to another ship, and uh, I guess the curse of, of my family followed him because about four months later, he lost his ship and no one returned from that ship. Oh